A lot of the highest performance code and hardware today can be found in machine learning systems. But how do these systems deliver their performance? The architecture you often see looks something like this. Using a stovepipe system design, models built from dense and convolutional layers can be targeted down to hand-tuned HPC code running on custom accelerators like Google's TPUs or Apple's neural engine. One consequence of this system design is that key portability interface is defined by HPC library APIs and not by the hardware assays. A second consequence is that all performance gains from accelerators are limited by the efficiency of this library code. However, there is surprisingly little work on programming languages to help performance engineers write these libraries. So what is so special about writing HPC libraries? In usual programs, we expect user code to change rapidly as a programmer develops software, while the hardware ISA changes very infrequently. In this system, the responsibility of targeting a new hardware is on compiler writers. The situation for HPC libraries is reversed. The specification of what programs should do, for example, BLAST or convolution, changes least frequently, even as hardware keeps getting updated. And even more frequently, performance engineers must constantly experiment with different ways of computing the same thing to find optimization opportunities. The main approach in research has been to try to automate this optimization process. But full automation would prevent performance engineers from doing their job, instead delegating it to compiler writers. This is usually a losing cost-benefit proposition because even modest gains in efficiency save millions of dollars at scale. So to help performance engineers be more productive, we are proposing an approach called exocompilation, by which I mean a language and compiler design that externalizes part of the compiler to give programmers more control. In the rest of this talk, we will discuss the design of our language and exocompiler EXO at a high level. Then we'll get into some details through a few examples, and we'll share some performance results in the end. So let's get started. EXO is an imperative procedural array language that is basically a subset of C. Specifically, EXO is a DSL embedded in Python that generates C code as an output. We found that many hardware accelerators have support for C compilers. Targeting C code therefore enables EXO workflow to fit into existing toolchains. Let's look at what it means to externalize hardware targets. In a traditional compiler, including most DSL compilers, the cost associated with targeting a new piece of hardware falls onto compiler writers. But in EXO, this responsibility is externalized to users instead. This kind of system decomposition is particularly necessary when hardware interfaces are proprietary and during the development of new hardware since the ISA is very unstable. Externalized hardware targets are defined via instructions, memories, and configuration states. We'll talk about these a bit more in the example. Now, let's move on to user scheduling aspect of EXO. With user scheduling, we want to write this simple code and end up with this optimized code by supplying a supplemental meta program that we call a schedule. This idea called user schedulable languages became popular over the last decade as a way of writing high performance code. Many of these systems treat scheduling as a way of parameterizing the lowering process. Instead, EXO uses a less common but simple idea of scheduling as rewriting within a single IR. As a result, large schedules are built from the sequential composition of atomic program trans transformations, which maps from a valid EXO program to another valid EXO program. Whenever we do such rewriting, we have to establish the equivalence of the procedures involved. The EXO compiler has a large set of such atomic scheduling primitives and checks their correctness using an SMT-based program analysis, which we will describe a bit later in this talk. 
So let's move on to understanding how EXO can be used to optimize data movement. As one of our first hardware backend, we targeted Gemini Accelerator. Gemini is an open source hardware developed at UC Berkeley, which has been taped out to ASIC. There are only three instructions that you need to know for this talk. Load instruction loads input from DRAM to Scratchpad. Map mode does a 16 by 16 matrix multiplication using input from Scratchpad and puts a result into the accumulator. Store instruction stores the output from accumulator to DRAM. Now, the question is how we model these instructions using EXO. In EXO, hardware instructions aren't special. They're just sub-procedures that splice in custom C-strings during code generation. Now let's try to think through how we can improve this naive map mode schedule to a more performant one. I'd like to invite everyone to think along with me. When you look at these load instructions, you might notice that J is not used in load A and I is not used in load B. It means that we are loading the same data for different I and J, which is redundant. This is problematic in this case because it makes this map mode code bandwidth bound. How might we improve this? Let's add a guard around the load instruction. This schedule is better because it doesn't have redundant loads, but instead it has two if statements in a most loop, which is generally a bad idea because it causes branch mispredictions. So how can we improve this? We can get rid of if statements by hoisting the load instructions out of the main loop. So this is preloading all inputs before map more. This looks good, and are we done with optimizing? Let's find out. The instruction sequence that we get from this code is this. We have this number of load instruction, and only after that, map more and store instructions are issued. One thing that I didn't mention yet is that CPUs often have instruction queues which they can reorder or execute in parallel, and that's also the case with Gemini. So if this instruction queue is filled up with only load instructions, the entire computation is blocked on load. So we want to get a better interleaving of load and map move instruction in this queue, right? Let's do that. And now we get this code, which we just saw. Recall that this code had guards in the innermost loop, which is expensive in general. So what does it mean? It means that optimization strategies have trade-offs. And to navigate through these trade-offs, you need to think through many aspects of the entire system. For example, what is the branching cost, what is the low latency, and what happens if we change the tile parameter. We could even ask the hardware developers to change the queue size. And the only way to find the best answer is by executing this code. We need to be able to rapidly prototype and execute code, and that was what EXO was built for. Now let's take a quick look on how this rapid prototyping can be achieved by EXO. Starting from simple map move, we can stage memories A, B, and C using EXO's stage mem operator. If you look at this red section closely, these are two loads, a map move and a store. The replace primitive lets you replace a code chunk with a corresponding EXO sub-procedure that models hardware instructions. From here, we can use a scheduling operation called add loop to wrap the B load loops in an additional loop over I and reorder the that guard to the inner loop. Finally, we can fuse the two loop nests together and get this in the lived code that we saw in the previous slides. Because we can apply this scheduling transformation easily, we can experiment more in the same budget of time. Now, I'd like to switch the talk to my co-author, Gilbert, to talk about the challenges we had from managing ISA level configuration state. Thanks, Yuka. Okay, let's look at the Gemini architecture again. In addition to memories and the systolic array, Gemini has hardware configuration state that changes the behavior of these basic instructions. 
For example, a stride parameter must be set to control how data is loaded from main memory into the scratchpad. So in EXO, we model this configuration state using global structures tagged with the keyword config. Then we write custom instructions to set this configuration state, and then make other instructions depend on the configuration state by reading its value. Getting back to our running example, I can be a bit more precise now. These instructions actually rely on communicating additional control data through this configuration state. However, naively resetting configuration state before each instruction is prohibitively expensive, both because it clogs up our inner loop and because reconfiguring often aborts the other instructions currently in flight. Therefore, we'd like to hoist all of these configuration instructions out of the loops, ensuring efficient execution. Unfortunately, this would lead to the wrong behavior for our loads, as you can see here, because loads of both A and B would then be using the configuration from B rather than their respective configuration states. So in this particular case, we resolve the issue through co-design. Hassan, our co-author and a Gemini hardware designer, exposed different versions of the load instructions to the software interface, allowing us to independently set configuration state for the two different loads. But I want to back up and focus on a more important question here for EXO itself. How is it that we determined that the original code transformation wasn't valid, but that once this change uh, from our collaborators happened, that the transformation would be valid? So one standard answer for this sort of question, uh, especially in the case of looping code over arrays, is to have some sort of dependency analysis using polyhedral sets over iteration spaces. However, such analyses don't handle the problem of global mutable state, which is what configuration state is. Specifically, um, when there are multiple redundant configurations of the same parameter, such as, for instance, I've changed both to just be dealing with the buffer A here, um, then we need a value-sensitive analysis to identify those redundancies. So obviously, the, the second config load A here is just setting the same parameter as the first one. But if all you're looking at is what memory is touched, you won't know that. So in our paper, we detail a way of combining polyhedral sets of effects with abstract interpretation of configuration state. This allows us to pose our program analysis queries in a decidable logic fragment that can be discharged to an SMT solver. And if this is all interesting to you, please come find me to chat. We'd love to get some more help with and feedback on this part of our system. Regardless of these details, uh, what these program analyses do is they allow performance engineers to cognitively offload the problem of correctness to the compiler writer. Just as the compiler writer is offloading responsibility for the performance optimization back to the performance engineer. This way, both kinds of engineers can spend more time focusing on their core competencies. So to validate our approach, we used EXO to optimize matrix multiplication and convolution on two different platforms. With less than a week of work, we were able to match MKL matrix multiplication performance on x86 with AVX512, achieving near peak machine throughput. We also replaced the pre existing Gemini subroutines with versions built using EXO. We evaluated these on a number of layers from ResNet 50 and our new code ran considerably faster. The results on convolution layers were similar. Compared to existing code, EXO programs are an order of magnitude more concise. So these are just some of our results. Uh, please take a look at our paper for more stories about how EXO performed in real hardware software co-design scenarios. We're also expanding the set of example hardware targets, collaborating with large hardware vendors, and have collaborators exploring auto-scheduling on top of EXO. You can find more information and resources about EXO at this link, with much more to come over the next month. So thanks for coming to the talk, and we'll take any questions you have.
a really nice talk. Um, one thing I was curious about is that some of these transformations uh, looks like there's some analysis that goes into enabling them, uh, but then the program changes. Uh, so do you rerun the analysis or can you incrementalize uh, the, the facts that you compute in between each step? Um, currently, we run, we rerun analysis in each of the rewrite steps. Hey, I was just wondering what sort of um, restrictions there are on the input array language that you guys support. So it seems pretty C-like. I think it's sort of a departure from a lot of these other compilers with scheduling languages. So we currently have restrictions that are uh, relatively similar to the static control program stuff from polyhedral setting, with the notable exception of the configuration state, of course, breaks that. We do maintain a control data separation, and um, the indexing we restrict to be affine, so that we can have a pretty precise analysis. We're interested in uh, relaxing those things, but you know, uh, we figured it was better to make the narrow version and then figure out how to relax it. Cool. Thanks. Great talk. Thank you. Um, so, how do you do an uh, instruction selection? Like, if you're using XO's ARM as an example, there are like two or three. Isa, you can choose to lower Matmo. Instruction selection. So, um, so uh, I'm not sure we mentioned that hardware instruction can be modeled as sub procedures in Excel. So, um, hardware instruction are really just like a procedure in Excel, and instruction selection is um, done like by users by using this primitive called replace. So replace takes a code chunk in EXO and replace with a sub procedure call, which is which happens to be hardware instructions or it can be like other instructions. But yeah, so thank you. So uh, fantastic work. Um, there's I, I feel like with a lot of the examples that you brought up early in the talk, things like Halide and Taco, the standard progression is we'll create a scheduling language to give programmers control over all of this stuff. And then we'll build an auto scheduler that actually just automates that process. Can you talk about maybe the prospects for something similar in Exo compilation? Yeah. So one of the things we're really interested in with Exo, um, which has been a stumbling block in Halide and these other languages. So if you look at the Halide auto schedulers, to be concrete, uh, but I think this carries over to most of the other languages. The way the auto scheduler works is. Um, you tell, I'd really like an, a schedule done automatically. It chugs along, it hands you one. You say, oh, that's great, except for this one part right here that you got wrong. Can I, I you know, just, just do this. That's great, right? And then you hand it to the auto schedule, it chugs along, gives you a complete schedule, ignores anything you did. Right? So it's not really a good way of having a human in the loop process here, which gives you a gradation between fully automatic and fully manual. And so one of the things where this rewriting approach, rather than parameterizing the lowering does, is it gives you a way to say, you can always have an automatic thing inserted in the middle of a manual process, and that can you know, handle some part of it. And you can always go in and patch it afterwards, run another automatic thing, patch it afterwards. Um, and we think this will be really useful, especially in the domain of targeting hardware, because ultimately you need to have some generic uh, automatic scheduling, which isn't going to know about your hardware to automate some things. You want some things which are specific to this hardware. You have something that works in some cases, that's so great, but maybe it doesn't get you all the way there. Uh, and we think that's really where the interesting sweet spot is. Thank you guys for the talk. It's awesome. Um, I'm just wondering what this looks like uh, when you bring it into something like PyTorch or TVM or TensorFlow, some higher level ML framework. What do you, what do you think is like the interface to, or, or what does EXO bring to those frameworks? Um, so right now, from the beginning of our talk, our basic premise for this, which could be wrong, but you know, I'll stick to our guns on it, is that the way a lot of this is happening in practice is that you have these subroutine calls to uh, various sorts of kernel libraries, which are tuned up very heavily. So a lot of these frameworks on top of it are ultimately figuring out which combination of subroutines and how to set the parameters and then how to sequence those things together. That's not necessarily 100% true, but that's roughly your template for things. And what that, at least in the case of the very heavily used models, so if you think of a large transformer model at Google or the large image processing models, this means that you can get a team of performance engineers to come in and apply all their expertise to get you that extra 5%. 
If you don't have a way of doing that, you're dropping a lot of performance and a lot of potential cost savings on equipment. 